Have you ever heard the line, things fall apart the centre cannot hold, or the best are full of uncertainty and the worst are full of passionate intensity? Well, those lines come from a poem by W.B. Yeats, and it's W.B. Yeats, the 1923 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, who I focus on in the Burning Archive podcast this week. You'll be absolutely amazed at the story of where those lines came from in the great poem, The Second Coming. It is a story of spirits and of nationalism and of the catastrophe that faced Europe in the 1920s. Amazing story. Join me for the Burning Archive podcast and learn why you should read W.B. Yeats in W.B. Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature 100 years ago. His early poetry in the 19th century sprang from the English Romantics and celebrated supernatural spirits of Irish mythology. His later poetry expressed arcane, mystic visions, yet somehow grasped the terrible new beauty of life in the 20th century. Why should you still read him today in the 21st century like a philosopher Ian McIlchrist does? That is the question for today's Burning Archive. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I am Jeff Rich, and welcome to the Burning Archive. And that was uh, philosopher, psychiatrist, Ian McGilchrist, author of The Master and His Emissary and of The Matter of Things, reading W.B. Yeats' poem, The Second Coming, or at least part of that poem. Uh, and this episode of the podcast celebrates the 100th anniversary of William Butler Yeats winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. It's part of my mini-series on the Nobel Prize for Literature leading up to the announcement on the 5th of October of the 2023 winner. And I'm going to have a look at at Yeats's contribution to literature and his enduring impact in the culture, how the past is not dead, the past is not even past, even W.B. Yeats, perhaps quite appropriately so, for someone who did uh, believe at times that he could commune with the spirits. Now, the Nobel Prize for Literature is a wonderful window onto the cultural heritage of the whole world, the whole multipolar world, as some people say. And over the course of this series, I'll be introducing you to five very different writers from different parts of the world. Last time I covered the history of the Nobel Prize and last year's winner, the French writer Annie Ernaud. And today I go back a hundred years to the Irish writer, the Irish poet, playwright and essayist W.B. Yeats, who you've, you've probably heard his name. You have almost certainly also heard his poetry lines not necessarily read within a poem, but spoken in general discourse. Have you ever heard someone said the centre cannot hold comes from a, a Yeats poem? And I guess I hope to show in these series of podcasts on the Nobel Prize how you can use historical texts, the cultural heritage of the world, to uh, see today's world more clearly and to connect with the heritage of the past and that the great diversity of that heritage as well. That's the kind of theme I explore in my writing and 
in my podcast. Now, if you have not already done so, do check out my website, theburningarchive.com. You can also sign up to my free weekly newsletter, Glimpses of the Multipolar World, at jeffrich.substack.com. Join the Substack, the growing Substack community of writers and readers, and you can read my pieces there every week. I send them out every Saturday morning, and for paid subscribers, I also produce a, an additional essay every fortnight. So that's a great way to follow my writing. And it this is your first time here, uh, check back over some of my previous episodes. My interview with the world's leading historian of the world, Felipe Fernandez Armesto. And if W.B. Yeats and poetry brought you here, you might also like my episode on Beowulf, the great uh, Anglo-Saxon poem, Beowulf, or early English poem, old English poem, Beowulf, Episode 26 from November 2021. In fact, it's such a ripper, I'm thinking I might even reissue it in a slightly edited form. But today I am talking about William Butler Yeats and his Nobel Prize. And I'm going to talk about understanding W.B. Yeats in the context of his life and times. I'm going to talk about the cultural heritage of Yeats's poems. I'm going to talk about some of the intriguing paradoxes of Yeats's poem, the second coming of Yeats's poem, both the poem by that name, but also his, I guess, continuing relevance to today's world. And uh, and then I will look ahead to our special episode next week. Okay, so let's talk first about understanding William Butler Yeats, uh, the great Irish poet and winner of the Nobel Prize in 1923 in the context of his life and times. I'm going to read my poem with great emphasis upon the rhythm. And that may seem strange if you are not used to it. I remember the great English poet, William Morris, coming in a rage out of some lecture hall where somebody had recited a passage out of his Seagull of Alston. It gave me a devil of a lot of trouble, said Morris, to get that thing into verse. It gave me the devil of a lot of trouble to get into verse the poems that I am going to read, and that is why I will not read them as if they were prose. William Butler Yeats lived from 1865, the year the US Civil War ended, to January 1939, just months before World War II began. He was a poet, a dramatist, a writer, a sponsor of the theatre and other writers, and he was also a politician, becoming a Senate in the Irish Free State in 1912 in the 1920s. He is widely seen as one of the greatest poets in the English language of the 20th century and one of the major figures of that great era of modernism between 1890 and 1930. And this era supplies so many of the canonical figures of my sense of culture and for the Burning Archive. Indeed, Yeats was friendly with indeed sponsored to some degree the American poet Ezra Pound whose lines are often quoted on this podcast. Yeats was an Anglo-Irish man born into an artistic family and he had a complex relationship to Irish nationalism and to the Easter Rebellion of 1916. He had a complex relationship to the conflict between the English and the Irish between the Protestants and the Catholics, between democracy and empire in Ireland in the early 20th century. And from the 1920s, he served two terms as a senator of the Irish Free State though he seems to have largely stuck to his knitting and focused on issues of culture and and heritage. Rather like uh, the Australian politician of 
who was a slightly earlier vintage, Alfred Deacon, his engagement with world affairs and politics did not prevent Yeats from being a mystic and indeed a spiritualist. He had a very complex emotional life involving a long, unrequited love with a major cultural figure, Maud Gone, and her daughter, and then a later marriage with another spiritualist, Georgie Hyde Lees, who took the name George after their marriage, and who will return to the story a little bit later. Maud Gone McBride was a wealthy Irish Republican revolutionary, suffragette and actress, and an advocate for Irish home rule, and then for the Republic declared in 1916. During the 1930s, as a founding member of the Social Credit Party, she promoted the distributive program of C.H. Douglas, and I've noticed there's been some recent uh, attention to those kind of ideas in recent times. Yeats's political and social views were similarly complex responses to the mixed legacy of Anglo-Protestant Empire in Ireland and the great traumas of the newly liberal democratic societies of, I guess, Europe and North America during World War I, the 1920s, and of course, the 1930s. At times in his last two decades of life, Yeats was drawn to authoritarian, anti-democratic nationalist movements of Europe. He opposed individualism and political liberalism and saw the fascist movements uh, of that time as a a way to re-establish public order and to uh, assert the needs of the national collective over petty individualism. I, of course, am just explaining his views. I'm not uh, advocating his views, just so I'm not quoted out of context. On the other hand, He was a mystic who was arguably not that well suited to politics. In 1923, St. John Irvine, another Irish writer and playwright, claimed with some personal knowledge of Yeats that he was isolated from, quote, the common life of his time and that he, quote, had never met anyone who seems so, that is, Irvine had never met anyone who seems so unaware of contemporary affairs, due not to affectation, but sheer lack of interest. He, as in Yeats, probably would not have known of the war at all had not the Germans dropped a bomb near his lodgings off the Euston Road. Uh, Well, Irvine made that comment in 1923, and perhaps St. John Irvine was just a little bit jealous that it was Yeats and not Irvine that won the Nobel Prize that year, because the cultural heritage of Yeats's poem suggests he perhaps knew quite a lot about the world. So, the cultural heritage of Yeats's poems. Well, the Nobel, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1923, this is what the Swedish Academy said about his contribution to literature. He was awarded the prize for his always inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. And in his uh, Nobel acceptance speech, the Nobel lecture, Yeats himself spoke largely about the Irish dramatic movement, the the theatre which he had been such an important part of. But he also provided a brief contextual historical account of the importance of, I guess, that feeling of the nation in Ireland in the early part of the 20th century, when Ireland was still very much a colony of England or Britain. He he says in his uh, lecture, the modern literature of Ireland, and indeed all that 
stir of thought which prepared for the Anglo-Irish War began when Parnell fell from power in 1891. A disillusioned and embittered Ireland turned away from parliamentary politics. An event was conceived and the race began as I thought think to be troubled by that event's long gestation. Now he did use the term race, I guess in a in a generous kind of nineteenth century sort of way to describe his own people. But uh, his his thoughts were very much uh, focused on the the great Irish rebellion of nineteen sixteen. So St John Irvine perhaps was a little bit harsh on his understanding of the world around him. Now, Yeats is still widely celebrated in Ireland, perhaps not surprisingly. He restored a like 15th or 16th century tower, indeed wrote a collection of verse about the tower and that has become something of a a vexed heritage site and recently I think last year for his 150th birthday in Ireland one of the major Irish papers actually collected a list of the 10 most culturally significant famous poems of W.B. Yeats. So what a great way to introduce them to someone who may not know all that much about Yeats. So I'll give you these ten poems. So number one, The Stolen Child from 1886 describes the loss of innocence, which, uh, the poem says, is more full of or describes a life where there is this loss of innocence, which is more full of weeping than he can understand. Number two is Sailing to Byzantium from 1928, which describes the spiritual symbolism of Byzantium, and I'll talk about that poem later. Number three is The Lake Isle of Innisfree, which is inspired by Ireland's landscape and is beautiful in its music. Number four is An Irish Airman Foresees His Death, which is a poignant war poem where the airman says, or the pilot says, I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight I do not hate. Those that I guard I do not love. A wonderful poem about ambiguity of, in, uh, I guess, being involved in a war which you do not choose. Very relevant to today. Number five from 1928, Among School Children, which was inspired by a visit to a local school. Number six, These Are the Clouds from 1910, which expresses some fear and ambivalence about modern life. Number seven, the leader and leader and as in L-E-D-A, and the swan, which is based on Irish and Greek mythology and describes uh, a sexual assault. Number eight, uh, Easter 1916, which describes the response to the Irish rebellion or the Irish revolution or the Irish revolt in Easter 1916, which has the line that all changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is Born And that line about a terrible beauty has often been used to describe not just the events of Easter 1916, but I guess the uh, modernist aesthetic of uh, the first half of the 20th century. Number nine, The Second Coming from 1920, and you heard a part of that from uh, read by Ian McGilchrist earlier in the show, and we'll come back to that poem later. And number 10, He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven, which is one of the love poems that Yeats wrote in his unrequited love for Maud Gone. So as you can hear from that list, some of his most resonant, deepest, most powerful works came from around the time or even after his receipt of the Nobel Prize. And you can uh, sense his deep engagement in myths, personal life, his 
mystical visions and the real world of the historical crisis as the terrible, beautiful, modern world of technology and wealth and democracy and war and atrocities and horrors unfolded during his life. So I think so. St. John Irvine really didn't get it right about Yeats. He may have been a mystic, but he did have a deep sense of the political crisis around him, of the world crisis, of the difficulty people were experiencing coming to terms with the changing world around them. And you've probably heard some of the lines such as the centre cannot hold or the best lack of all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity that come from that great poem uh, from 1920 uh, in the, the, the strife of Europe after World War I, the second coming. But he is a paradoxical figure, Yeats, nonetheless, this strange combination of nationalist, but kind of aristocrat maybe, uh, Anglo-Irish identity, supporting his country become independent, yet be rather sceptical about its democratic potential, and also somehow combining this this perception into the nature of the world around him with this very odd kind of mysticism. This is the intriguing paradox of W.B. Yeats. How could such insight into history and the world, um, going through a great crisis as Ireland, Europe, the world did from 1914 to 1939 or to 1945, how could it coexist with strange, arcane theories inspired by sessions communing with the spirits. That's the paradox of Yeats. And in a way, that is one reason why you should read him today. His best known poem, The Second Coming, well, I think probably his best known poem, The Second Coming, one of his best known poems, The Second Coming, expresses this, where the centre cannot hold. It expresses that sense of a world falling apart in its sense-making, falling apart in its politics falling apart in the poly crisis a much less elegant way of expressing it but this poem also expresses the speculative historical philosophy that Yeats set out in a celebrated work of occult philosophy called a vision which also expressed the intuitions and dream images of his wife Georgie Yates who took the name George Yates after their marriage. I believe she changed the spelling of her name for numerological reasons. And this book itself has a very very strange story. Yates married late and with ambivalence George or Georgie who was 30 years younger than him. Uh, the marriage did not start well since Yates felt he had made the wrong choice. So George suggested they attempt some automatic writing as practiced by surrealist, modernist people interested in dreams and the occult. The accounts of this process suggest that uh, George knowingly used this process to confirm Yeats's commitment to the marriage, but the automatic writing developed in an unexpected way, and as quite a surprise to her. As she was doing the automatic writing, she felt her hand seized by a superior power. A not uncommon feeling for uh, the, you know, occasionally somewhat mystical writers of the world, they then, both the Yeatses, W. William Butler and Georgie George, conducted three years of these sessions of automatic writing, often daily, where W.B. Yeats was the questioner and George was the medium or interpreter of the wills of the spirit. 
the the person who spoke the voices of the gods, so to speak. And these were followed by rather less frequent sleeps where George would speak from a trance in sleep, which is called automatic script. Um, the sessions reduced a bit after the birth of their children between 1919 and 1921, but the fragmentary notes were used primarily by W.B. Yeats to create his system or their system of occult philosophy in a vision. It got written up as a book that got revised a number of times. First published, I think, in 1925. This uh, book of philosophy, a vision, included ideas of circular time or cycles of time, wheels of time, not linear time as in linear progress. Those ideas of circular time were the gyres, G-Y-R-E-S, that appear in the first lines of a second coming. Gyres are the great ages of time, the great spiralling cycles of time, and they are not dissimilar to the Hindu concept of uh, great ages. I suppose most people are aware of the concept of, uh, I guess, karma and, you know, the the cycle of birth and rebirth in uh, Hindu philosophy or Hindu thought. And But there's also in Hindu thought or Hinduism a sense that there are yugas, which are great, Y-U-G-A-S, which are great expanses of time through which the course of spiritual evolution is run. There are four yugas, some of which go for over a million years. And the current era, if you like, the current yuga is the Kali yuga, which has been going on for a long time. The great Indian epic I believe the Mahabharata is sort of seen as kind of uh, uh, like the end of one of these yugas. It's the great war to end the cycle of time. And uh, when the Kali Yuga is over, the entire universe dies. And from these ashes, the universe will eventually recreate itself and cycle through the process again and again. And again, and it's a not dissimilar idea that Yeats is evoking with his sense of Gaia's. The cycle, the poem is about a second coming. It's not just about, it's about a cycle of destruction that's returning to a starting point. It's not just a a story of a polycrisis that we'll find our way through before we get back on track to progress, control and dominion of the world. The second coming in the poem is not really the coming of a messiah it's almost a sort of a figure of destruction and ruin what rough beach beast slouches towards bethlehem so out of this strange process of automatic writing you could arguably say that george yates or georgie yates has some moral claim to the authorship of a vision and even perhaps the great poem a second coming or the second coming. And I just think it's a wonderful story, isn't it, of this strange semi-mystical dream image transforming itself into still a vision that communicates to people something which is meaningful about the world that they are experiencing, the changes that they are going through, that finds words that connect to people about that. Somehow that intuition and imagination express something more meaningful, insightful and enduring than all the theories, political speeches and realistic analyses of lesser writers like St. John Irvine. So what is the second coming of Yeats? Uh, Funnily enough, I mean that in two ways. One is that Yeats does seem, still seem, 
seems relevant to our world, even though he has his origins very much in the late 19th century, a very different world. And I'm not the only person who sees that many people evoke or or will often quote Yeats's poetry, particularly the second coming, to evoke a sense of crisis, to evoke a sense of uh, people not coping with the crisis before them. And the great psychiatrist and philosopher Ian McKilchris sees the second coming as still relevant. Uh, and that's why I sort of used a small reading of his of that poem by McCulchrist at the head of the show. The Irish author Paul Kingsnorth has written a fascinating essay on the relevance of Yeats and the sort of circular vision of time and history to dealing with our times in terms of environment and the impact of technology and industry, uh, finding a way of living that uh, proposes less threat to the environment, that poses a different resolution to the dilemmas of living in the modern world. So Yeats's poetry, initiated in part by automatic writing sessions with George Yeats, is worth reading still. It is very much part of the canon of the Burning Archive. So uh, let me read The Second Coming in full. It's only 22 lines. Uh, I'll also point, after this point, uh, I'll I'll let you know where you can find a real professional actor reading this great poem. (laughs) So The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack of or conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight, Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body, and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So, yes, there are many, uh, no doubt, better readings of that poem, but I hope you appreciated that. And what I'm also going to do is just quickly read one of Yeats's other great poems, Sailing to Byzantium, because that is dark and ominous, that poem. Whereas Sailing to Byzantium expresses a somewhat more optimistic uh, note, and uh, not optimistic, Optimistic note, especially relevant to uh, people of my age and people of my stage of life, let's say, as I approach my 60th birthday. Now, you will probably also recognise lines from this poem, Sailing to Byzantium uh, 2, if nothing else but from the title of the Quentin Tarantino film from two. 2007 No Country for Old Men, uh, which I guess also is a somewhat dark vision of the world today. 
But Yeats's poem expresses a more hopeful spirit, I think. So uh, let me just read the uh, first two stanzas of this poem to put us all into a better emotional state. So sailing to Byzantium, uh, first two stanzas. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations, at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh or fowl, commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Two wonderful poems by William Butler Yeats. Uh, If you're really interested, you might also want to check out A Vision. There's all sorts of sites dedicated to that uh, occult philosophy but and his essays are also quite profound i was checking my oxford dictionary of quotations and the significance of yates you can see by the fact that like some people might get two or three quotes uh, in the oxford dictionary of quotations some people get just one Uh, and I guess you're doing well to get one as well but there's about four pages of Yeats's lines from poetry speeches and plays and prose in that collection and again I would encourage you to check out some of the better professional actor readings of Yeats's poems that you can uh, get online although I hope I didn't do too bad a job I've got links to some of those professional performances of uh, Sailing to Byzantium and The Second Coming and other poems by Yeats on my website uh, where I have the sort of story and notes to this episode of the podcast so do check it out and you can follow the links there to my writing my books my articles courses and the podcast backlist as well as discover all sorts of wonderful aspects of the cultural heritage of the multi polar world and that website is the burning archive t-h-e-b-u-r-n-i-n-g-a-r-c-h-i-v-e dot com and on this podcast uh, i suppose every week this tattered cloak upon a stick claps his hands and sings of the fragments of the burning archive he has recovered and seeks to take with him on his journey to the holy city of Byzantium. Next week, I will be looking at the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature 50 years ago in 1973. And coincidentally, because it was just a random thing to go 100 years and 50 years, but coincidentally, the winner in 1973 was the Australian novelist. That's right, Australian culture finally gets a gig on the Burning Archive. The Australian novelist Patrick White, the only Australian so far uh, and likely for the foreseeable future to have won the Nobel Prize. Please remember to visit theburningarchive.com and consider buying my books or doing my online course on mindful history and certainly also please subscribe for free to my youtube channel like and share and and watch some of the great videos i have there i have some of my podcast content but i also do extra videos on the youtube channel just the other week i did a whole 
video featuring the six shortlisted books for the Wolfson History Prize. And it's a great resource to find a great new read for the upcoming summer if you live in Australia or I guess the winter if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. And also, why not join me at jeffrich.substack.com where you can sign up to my free weekly newsletter and even take out a paid subscription so that my cloak does not get too tattered as this old man. And in that spirit of sailing to Byzantium, let this aged poultry but now retired very minor government official, official wish you a wonderful week and invite you to remember that what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee.